just gave everyone a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness that we couldn't do anything, even if we wanted to. The whole situation just makes you feel robbed of being with your loved ones, not being able to hold or to hug them. We couldn't hold her hand or be with her. Was it a dream? Was it even real? This virus doesn't attack based on anything or anyone specific. It's affected everyone on the planet in one way or another. Some are jobless. We're not socializing with each other. It's equalized and humbled all of us in its path. Brings down the banker and the baker. Doesn't matter. The virus is unbiased. Put us all on common ground in that sense. I'm wondering if anyone sees any correlation with the models we've been discussing and with what we just saw. Yes, Emily? The thing that kept on coming to the forefront of my mind while watching all those people dying is that they were just trying to survive. It seems so so basic and so real. We're all literally just trying to survive this pandemic. So I think that highlights the humanistic model of management. We all have that in common. At our core, we all have that in common. And we want to feel safe physically and, and psychologically. Um, I know I do. My friends do. So COVID is showing the entire world just how, how fundamental the need to be social and to feel that safety. I mean, look at what happened when we were told to quarantine. There was pushback. The thought of it terrified people. Everyone's fine until you tell them to social distance and shelter in place and then look out. Really, we're all trying to create true meaning for ourselves in the world we live in. So so I think this addresses the fourth drive. I agree with you, Emily. Yes, it addresses the ABCDs of humanistic model that we've been discussing. A, acquire. B, bond. C, comprehend. D, Defend, all of them, working together. Yes, Rams? <clears throat> Let me just say, okay, yes, the economistic teachings are to take, 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 and all that, but, and just hear me out, is that such a terrible thing? Hmm? Isn't this the model that allowed the wealthy people to have a vacation home to go to? Huh? I mean, how are they going to be able to do the uh, the natural bonding and uh, socializing you're talking about otherwise? I just don't see what's wrong with that. Lincoln? I mean, th there's nothing wrong with having the big house to escape to because you've achieved wealth. I mean, that's great. But where's the balance? I have... All of the CEOs and managers who were privileged enough to flee to their beachside homes and villas balanced that with the humanistic model. Are they taking into account on a deep level their workers who have to take public transportation and risk their lives and their families' lives to clock in on time so these CEOs who are safe and clinking their social distance wine glasses don't fire them? Are they taking responsibility for their safety? I mean, if they are, then uh, okay. But something tells me that most, if not all, stopped dead short at the economistic model while they smile as the ocean breeze wafts into their mansions. These managers aren't balancing their own four drives. And clearly, they're neglecting the four drives of those they manage. People are dying by the hundreds of thousands. Yes, people are dying, Lincoln. The numbers are devastating. How many more? How many leaders and managers will continue to violate the three E's while their workers die because of their decisions? 
How many more? You're brave to, to share that, Lincoln. Thank you. Rose? Um, uh, I feel horrible too, Lincoln. It's so hard. And I think this is why the humanistic model perfectly explains why COVID has had such a deep effect on us all. Because I think really, really deep down, Human beings are good, at least they can be good, but they're scared and vulnerable. And COVID really brought that out in everyone, even rich people in their mansions who could afford all the health care they needed. They're still scared and vulnerable like everyone else. And I think it takes a great manager to see that in human beings and manage from that place with care and thought and even love. If I might add, countries that took immediate action for their people and had the most effective results were all led by women. Jacinda Ardern from New Zealand, Angela Merkel from Germany, Tsai Ing-wen from Taiwan, Katrina Jakobsdottir from Iceland, Sana Marin from Finland. As you can see, the list goes on and on. Thank you, Mackie. Rams? Uh, you okay there? Uh, it's always the woman thing. If a woman ran the country, it'd be so much better off and all that. Ugh. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Rams, but um, Governor Cuomo, he led his state entirely from a humanistic model. And he's a man. He effectively and efficiently got our hospital workers their PPE. He made the hospitals up and down state communicate with each other and work together. And, and I believed his ethics when he talked about not letting the elderly community die just because they were old. He definitely balanced the four drives. He honored everyone's dignity. Here, and, and listen to this. New York loves all of you. Black and white and brown and Asian and short and tall and gay and straight. New York loves everyone. That's why I love New York. It always has. It always will. And at the end of the day, my friends, even if it is a long day, and this is a long day, love wins. Always. And it will win again through this virus. Thank you. Love wins. Efficient, effective, and ethical management wins. Yes, it can. I, I want you all to see it's, it's, it's possible. It was done. Right there are examples of countries and states led with care and empathy and the four drives that have people surviving. Countries with leaders following the economistic model are opening businesses, are, are, are saying masks don't matter, science doesn't matter, facts don't matter. Their people are dying. Don't listen to me. Look, 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 look at the numbers, the facts. We can't buy toilet paper without money. We can't buy toilet paper with love or ethics. Please, people, work with me here. If we don't open business, people will die too. Families won't eat. <sighs> In 2018 to 19, the flu killed over 34,000 people and we didn't shut the world down. <sighs> okay, Rams, yes, true. L l let's please remember, these are not just numbers. Every single number that we talk about is a life that has an effect on another life. Lives upon lives. Yes, businesses need to make money, but we can balance our thinking and our actions. That's all I'm saying. We don't buy all the toilet paper in the store just because we can. It was that take take mentality that, that led to the shortage. Kai? Rams. I will share my toilet paper with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> The economistic way has and always will continue to give way to horrific dignity violations. It's based in fear. The fear of not having enough for ourselves, 
pride of taking things. <laughs> and when fear conspires with pride, look out. Let's keep talking about these indignities right now with the COVID crisis. Yes, Kai? I don't think we can get through this conversation without discussing the unbearable, disproportionate amount of black and brown people dying from this disease. Thank you so much, Kai. Would you like to share with the class your last few weeks? I'll, I'll leave it up to you. My grandfather, who raised me, died of COVID. It's why I haven't been to the last few classes. Thank you, Professor. He was 74. He was still driving a bus when he started to feel sick. Still working at 74 years old because he had to. He adored baseball. And his grandkids. They all tease me that I was his favorite. He was the one who begged me to go into business because he thought our generation could change things. So he spent three straight weeks helping me to get my scholarship. <laughs> A hero. Anyway, one night, I heard my mom screaming at somebody on the phone, saying, his life matters. We will not let him be ignored. She was pleading with the nurse to get his cell phone from his pants so that we all could see him. But the hospitals were overcrowded, so... He died. Alone. He has this whole big family. Yet he was all alone. We still don't have his body. I never got to say goodbye. Every family I know has a story similar to mine. It's real. People don't want to believe it. There's something much deeper going on here. Sometimes when you're in the middle of a crisis, like we are now with the coronavirus, uh, it really does have ultimately shine a very bright light on some of the real weaknesses and foibles in our society. Even though Black Americans are living longer than they have in the past, they are still more likely to die at early ages from all causes. When we filter the entire U.S. workforce by race, we find Black workers account for 13% of the labor force. It's comparable to their numbers in the nation's general population. And when we drill down to see what kinds of jobs people have, we learn people of color are more likely to be in roles deemed essential in this pandemic. Roles like the one Leilani Jordan had. Black and Hispanic workers are at the top of the list for work the government calls production, as well as the service industry, transportation, and material moving. These generally lower paid jobs likely don't have paid sick leave, health insurance, or retirement benefits. Black people also have higher unemployment numbers than any other group. Um, did I get this straight? Okay, when it talks about the kind of jobs people had, it said that, that Black and Hispanics are more likely to be in jobs that, that we've deemed essential. Those were the jobs we were cheering for at 7 p.m., right? These essential workers that we actually couldn't live without. The people who scan our groceries, run public transportation, our doctors, nurses, the the mail service that deliver our freaking Amazon packages. Sorry, just these workers essential to our daily living. But then it also said, and, and I wrote it down, that those exact jobs are at the top of the list for what the government calls production. Production? Human beings risking their lives showing up to work in a job deemed essential and are grouped as production? And we pay them less? And, and don't give them healthcare? We should be volunteering every second to get them anything they need and, and to keep them and their families safe and, and alive and paid. And they need more than a few cheers and whistles from the window. This is insane. God, 
Sorry, okay, I totally freaked out there, but I'm just... We'll allow it. I'm so angry. Anger can make real change, Emily. Don't forget that. Yes, Lincoln? How are we letting this happen? Combination of things. Human beings are phenomenal, complex creatures, capable of both harm and good. Look, so, some of this thinking is instinctual. We were born with it, kept us safe from harm. The, the saber-toothed tiger chases us, we run. That's not our fault, no one's fault. By five years old, we've developed social constructs. And then some of it, yes, is what we're taught from those around us who were taught by those around them. Different biases and belief systems, prejudices, hey. <laughs> Good news, each one of us can decide how we're going to go forward. Yes, Rose? My parents both taught me to value everyone, no matter what, and to take care of those who had less than me. So they only taught me really important stuff. I hear you, Rose. What I'm talking about is subtle, insidious societal teachings that we can't even recognize when they're happening. Some by our parents, sure, our professors, society, education, media, all of it. And we believe it. Someone says it, we just believe it. We don't discern whether it even fits our values. Naki? Buddha said, do not believe in anything simply because you have heard it, but after observation, and analysis, when you find that anything agrees with reason and is conducive to the good of one and all, then accept it and live up to it. Thank you, Mackie. Okay, speaking of observations, how many here wear glasses? Raise your hands. You sure? <laughs> I got 2020. You're positive. 100%. I can see you clear as day. <laughs> what if I suggested we all wear glasses? Heuristic glasses. We stereotype. We, we limit who the whole human being is. I do it. We all do it. It's immediate. Habit. Again, great news, not our fault. Generational, societal, cultural. We judge based on our differences. Rams? No way. I don't. I have uh, black friends, white friends, Chinese friends. And I, I appreciate that. I'm not talking about the friends we, we have. I'm talking about something deeper that stops us from seeing the value of a person before we even realize we've done it. I'm talking about what allows managers to view humans as production. Just for a moment, just go there. Allow yourselves to deeply consider where you may wear these glasses. Uh, hmm? My mom. How so? It's like, it's like she walks in the room and before she can even say anything, it's like, I'm, I'm ready to argue with her. And sometimes it happens before I can even stop it. Okay, yes, exactly. You view her a certain way through your lenses, your glasses. Yeah, yeah, it's like at some point, and, and I don't even know when, I made, I made a decision about, about who I feel she is. And, and I feel really bad about it because it's like, I don't even see her as a person. Sometimes, even though I love her, I, I forget she's this, this awesome trailblazer in our community. I mean, she, she ran into this burning building and, and rescued that two-year-old, but all I see is, is this, this mom who still tells me what to do. Yes, Mackie? Oh, man. It's hard for me to say this, but I gotta admit it to someone. And being that we're talking about Okay, I gotta say, every time I'm flying, I feel this prejudice for anyone that looks as though they may practice the Muslim faith. I immediately think that I'm in danger. If they wear a hijab or a burqa, I'm holding my breath, bracing for impact, trying to land. And it's only when I fly. Other times, I welcome all faiths, all religions. It happened the other day. This Muslim goose was simply telling me to fly higher due to bad weather. 
but all I saw was the hijab and I panicked. They were just trying to keep me safe. I couldn't see past my glasses. I was terrified. I could see the sadness in their eyes as they flew away, having seen I was frightened of them. I'm really ashamed about that. I was humiliated into humility. You know what? Who am I to judge? I'm transgender. I know exactly what it's like to be looked at through really thick glasses. Yeah, everyone assumes I eat people because of Little Red Riding Hood. I'm a vegetarian. Maggie, I just want to say you really helped me so much and I want to thank you. I, I was thinking that I didn't even wear glasses. <laughs> well, you know, you know what I mean, the heuristic ones. And then when you were sharing, I... I was thinking about, you're right, this is really hard to admit, but I was thinking about my roommate, who is really awesome and kind and funny and smart, and she's so confident in being gay and her sexuality. Well, sometimes I realize now that I maybe am the littlest bit uncomfortable around her, and I look at her differently. Uh, and I, did, I, I didn't even know it until you were talking. I'm really sorry if this offends anyone. Uh, I didn't even realize it until now. I'm sorry. This is the place to become aware of patterns that we have, Rose. We all help each other when we tell the truth, as long as dignity and respect for ourselves and others are leading us. Lincoln? I is there a way we can, you know, like, to take off the glasses? There is. We can embrace the humanistic model of management. Dignity, ethics, responsibility. We don't have to meet each other with our glasses on. <laughs> we can be smarter. We can have an EQ. Wait, what, Professor? Did you say EQ or uh, IQ? <laughs> Good catch, Lincoln. It's easy to get confused. Yeah. Watch this. Daniel, in terms of predicting who is going to be in the top 10% of performers, i.e. the sort of the star performers, you say that EI, emotional intelligence, is more as a sort of a better gauge than IQ. So can you just tell me why that is the case? It's very simple. Study after study shows that uh, in order to be in a, a top profession, in order to be an engineer, in order to get an MBA, in order to get an MD, um, or be a top executive, you need to have an IQ that's about one standard deviation above normal or higher. That puts you at about 115 IQ. But then the studies show after that there is no correlation between your IQ and your actual effectiveness or success in that line of work. Whether you're a CEO, uh, academic, an engineer, doesn't matter. Why? because that is the IQ level you need to master the technical skills and the co it's the cognitive capacity you need to handle that profession. But after that, think about it. Once you're in the field, you're competing with people who are about as smart as you are. There's really no... Uh, throughout school, IQ is a huge advantage for grades. In the workplace, after, that, after you reach that criterion level, it has no, very little added benefit, and what makes the difference are your personal abilities. How you manage yourself, do you stay motivated, do you stay focused, are you adaptable, are you self-aware, and your interpersonal abilities. Can you read other people? Do you know how to get along well? Are you a team, good team player? Can you be a leader? And those all depend on emotional intelligence. Daniel, I've got no doubt that people that are watching this are, are sold on your premise of emotional intelligence. But the big question I think people will be wanting to ask is, what, once you know your EI level, can you improve or can you become more emotionally intelligent? Yeah, the good news is that you can improve uh, emotional intelligence com competencies. These are learned abilities that build from the fundamentals. So, for example, uh, emotional self-control, staying calm under pressure. This is a capacity that can be learned. The steps are quite well known, but you need to, first of all, want to get better. Listening, listening well, listening deeply. That's a critical empathy skill. 
And if you have poor listening habits, it's like the common cold of leadership, then you can't improve. But again, you, you need to be motivated. Why? Because in adulthood, you have to undo, at the brain level, undo over-rehearsed habits. That's your habitual way of, of reacting. And build a new one until it becomes more strongly practiced than the old one. Then you'll do it naturally. And that takes uh, real effort and real motivation. Daniel, talking about self-motivation, what's the core essence of being self-driven and motivated to move forward as an individual? Well, I, I think that motivation has to be true, that you need to uh, align the desire to improve with, with your own sense of values and purpose, what you really feel is important. What are your dreams? Where do you want to go in life? Is something holding you back? Can you change that for the better? That's the kind of genuine motivation that helps people really make the change. What about our EQ? Daniel Goleman was discussing. Emotional intelligence. Oh. Rams? Oh. Rams? <laughs> I am really angry. This isn't what I signed up for. Emotion? Well, guess what, Rams? Oh no. At this very moment, you're the most emotionally intelligent person in the room. Awareness. You recognized your inner life. You put it to words. You could have stormed out of the room or reached for a, a distraction, but you recognized it. Self-awareness. We just witnessed Mackie and Rose share that. We can start there. Okay, how many of you think you have awareness? Go ahead, raise your hands. Who here thinks they have awareness? How many don't think you have awareness? Aha, there it is again. Rose and Kai, that, that, that's awareness as well. Recognition. You are aware, you're unaware. How beautiful is that? Excellent. Rams, you're feeling angry, right? Yes. You could have reacted differently. You didn't. You named the feeling. Viktor Frankl, the Australian neurologist and psychiatrist, said between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Growth and freedom. We have the ability to be free of our habitual behavior and beliefs. Mr. Frankel came to that conclusion while a prisoner in Auschwitz. He wrote Man's Search for Meaning. The search for meaning. That goes back to our drive to comprehend. Lincoln? I really liked when uh, Daniel Goleman talked about the motivation aspect of leadership. I, I was always... Well... <laughs> Correction, I was taught uh, that motivation equaled winning, de defeating. M motivation equaled drive to do something big. I never thought of it as being aligned with your values and being able to use that for the better of. <laughs> I, I just never thought of it that way. I'd love to manage that way. And we can manage that way with empathy, the ability to understand and see the emotional makeup of others. Deep listening. This is all great stuff. I want to end with a few things to think about. When I say mindfulness, what's your first thought? Go ahead, put your heuristic glasses on. Kai? A monk? Yoda. Deep breathing. I think of a mind full of a lot of stuff. Rose? I've been um, practicing mindfulness for the last few years because I used to, well, I still do sometimes, but I've gotten much, much better, but I used to have panic attacks. So my dad found this meditation oh. teacher. Oh, no. Go ahead, Rose. <laughs> 
No, Rams. I know. Whenever anyone hears meditation or mindfulness, they get all weirded out. But really, it's so easy. It's just about stillness and compassion for ourselves and for others. Yes, right. Professor, please say you're not going to try and get us to meditate, are you? Because I can't. I know for a fact I can't. It would be impossible to get rid of the stuff in my brain. Okay, so great work, Rams. You're questioning. You're discerning what works for you and what doesn't. What feels right for you as an individual. Yes, Rose? Um, um, sorry. I, I, I just wanted to finish, so... Meditation is not about getting rid of stuff. More like getting familiar with it. Just sort of allowing whatever comes up to be there. And not judging good or bad. And then breathing. Letting it go. <laughs> and it usually comes back again and again. But that's okay too, because... We're just getting to know it like a new friend or whatever. Uh, it was so hard for me at first, but it really is cool. So, yeah, it just keeps you more present. Thank you for bringing up presence, Rose. Being mindful and present allows us as individuals to live in the space where we can balance the four drives if we practice it. As we discussed, doesn't necessarily come naturally, but we can develop a desire and aspiration to attain this way of being. If we lead from a place of honoring our dignity, we can be excellent individuals, excellent individuals who are mindful, aware, empathic. They make excellent leaders. I'm asking you to just be curious about this. Think about having a world where everyone flourishes. And that is accomplished by all of you as leaders and managers. Think about having the courageous character to manage from the humanistic model. Yes, Mackie? Uh, Martin Luther King said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. The content of their character. The character of a human being. Yes, Kai? What if I fundamentally dislike someone's character because it's different from mine? Great question, Kai. Look at this class today and all that we covered. How we are alike, how we are different. We have faced our biases, learned more about our personalities, learned ways to, to manage our emotions, and how to develop new leadership skills. And we did this as individuals with very different characters. It's natural. We are different. It's the way it is. But we must take inventory of our character mindfully with compassion for ourselves and be willing to take off our glasses and see past our emotions, see the value and dignity of every human being. As managers, we must seek to understand and respect the content of each person's character with the four drives of the humanistic model of management leading us. If we do this, there's nothing we can't do. That's excellence and we can be excellent. You all were today. I thank you. See you next class.